All right, so Deuteronomy chapter 20, are we all there? Are we all ready? Jump on the word. So we're not going to get very far today. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 1 to 4. Verses 1 to 4 says, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots, and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. It shall be, when you are come nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble, and neither be ye terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Now, Israel is getting, they're in the promise, or sorry, they're in the wilderness, getting ready to cross over the river Jordan into the promised land. So God makes sure that they understand as they're preparing to cross into the promised land that they need to know that they're going to face impossible odds. They're going to go across enemies that are just larger than them in numbers and impossible odds. And God promises at the end of verse 4 that he's going to save them and give them victory, right? And so today's passage is super, super encouraging. It should be, it should be lifting you up. It should be super edifying. Uh, so that, that's what's happening is there's victory in battle, right? Now, doctrinally, I want you to understand something. He's telling the nation of Israel that they are always going to be at war. And if you've ever followed the nation of Israel, if you paid attention to history, you understand that Israel is always at war. They're always in battle. Why? Because people want to wipe them off of the face of the earth. And so he's letting them know, when thou goest out to battle, the statement is when, not if, isn't it? It says, when thou goest out to battle. So he's preparing them and letting them know, you are always going to be at war, you're always going to be outmatched, and God is always going to lead you to victory. I think about stories like, uh, like Jericho. Remember, they walked around the city, the walls fell down, and God gave them great victory where they should not have gotten victory. I'm thinking about Gideon and the fighting, fighting war with just a few hundred men. I, I'm thinking about, uh, I'm thinking about the, the Six Day War when nations came against Israel in, in, in the 40s and also in the 60s when they came to destroy them and God miraculously gave them victory. I'm reminded of Revelation chapter 20 that nations are going to surround the city of Jerusalem to compass it about, to destroy it, and God is going to that send down fire from heaven to consume them. There's not even going to be a battle. And over and over and over again, Israel is outmatched. Israel is always ready to be defeated, and God always shows up. That's doctrine. What you need to understand with Israel is there's never going to be peace in the Middle East until Jesus Christ is sitting on the throne. Amen? It's just, that's just the reality uh, of the fact. Is Israel is always going to be war. There's always going to be turmoil. There's turmoil now with Palestinian rocket fire going into, into Israel almost on the daily. Right? It's happening all the time. But today, I don't want to focus so much on that. I want to focus on a very practical, personal application here. And as the fact is, you and I are always going to face opposition. Just as Israel is always at war, we, as believers in Christ, are always going to be at war. Uh, opposition from our enemies. Anytime, and this is so, so important to get, anytime that you choose to walk in God's promises. Because the promised land is not a picture of heaven. The promised land is a picture of victory as you follow Jesus with your life. It's a, it's, a, it's a land of promises. And as you choose to walk in the promises, as you make this decision to say, I'm going to follow the Lord with my life, I guarantee you opposition will meet you. Opposition will be there to take you on. Your enemies will be there to destroy you. But the moment you say, I'm not interested in following the Lord, I want to wander in the Lord. It's God lets you wander there. But you're not going to find opposition from the enemy a whole lot of times. It's when you make the decision to be a follower of Christ, to be a disciple, to make disciples, to launch into a specific ministry, to own whatever it is that God has called you to do, you will go through moments of crisis. You will go through uh, opportunities where the enemy wants to come in and destroy you. Amen? And that's what we're going to get into uh, today. So, verse 1. He says, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest forces, and chariots, and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. So today's message title is simply, When the Saints Go Marching In. We're the saints. Amen? Some of you are saying, Listen, it's time for the saints to march into battle. 
instead of talking about it, you're prepared for it, it's time to launch out and get into battle, to take it out, to get after it. So here's your first point. You will always have a battle to fight. You will always have a battle to fight. I heard an invention that says when, not if. You are always going to get war. You are always going to have a battle to fight. Here's your next point. You will always have a battle to fight because your enemies are always at war with you. You see, there's wars, and then every war has many, many battles. And you're always going to be at battles, after battle after battle, because your enemy is at war with you. They have declared war against you. There's always going to be a fight. And our enemies are Satan, the world, and the flesh. That's who our enemies are. Now, that's super important to get. He says, when thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, against thine enemies, even when it seems like you're a peacetime, even when it seems like, man, I don't have any fights. I feel like things are going okay. I feel like I'm not in a battle. You better be prepared because anytime you're not in a fight, anytime you're not in a battle, your enemy is preparing to attack. If you don't believe me, check this out. Job chapter 1, verse 9. Job chapter 1, verse 9 says, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Did Job fear God for not? So the whole time Job is living his life, Job is, is perfect, he is he's evil, he's, a, he's just a, he's a son of, 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 a, of a believer in the Lord, he's just following the Lord, and Job is being discussed by, by the Lord himself and Satan. And the Lord has said, hey, have you considered my servant Job? And, and Satan responds back here in verse 9, then, answered, then, then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for not? Has not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance and his increased in thy land. Verse 11. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. So Satan says, okay, Lord, if you let me touch him, you let me take away everything he has, I promise you, he will curse you. He will curse you. And so what is Satan's whole goal is to drive a wedge, to drive a division between God and his people. And so Satan is now coming before the Lord and says, give me permission to attack. So Job is at peace. Everything is going well in his life, unaware that there is spiritual warfare happening. Unaware that Satan and the Lord are having a dialogue about him. You ever consider that? That maybe Satan and the Lord are having a dialogue about you? You ever consider that? Because that blows my mind. Because Satan is not attacking anybody who's, who's sitting on the bench. He's not wasting ammunition on anybody who's not, who's not in the fight. Right? He's not interested in that. But he's coming after Job. Verse 12. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that, is in thine, it, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself, but not forth thy hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. In a moment, in a day, Job loses everything, doesn't he? He went from peace to utter warfare in a moment of time. That's how it works for us. That's exactly how it works for the body of Christ. We're always being attacked. And when it seems like we're not being attacked, they're planning the next one. It's planning the next one. So it says, when thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them. Here's your next point. You are always going to feel like you're outnumbered by your enemies. So not only are you going to be attacked, but it's always going to be overwhelming. It's always going to seem like more than you can handle. It's always going to seem uh, like, I, I can't do this. I can't, I can't take on this fight anymore. I'm just done. It's always going to be seem, seem overwhelming. Why? Because it's always going to seem like you're outnumbered. You're going to see horses, and you're going to see chariots, and you're going to see a great host surrounding you, and you're going, I can't win this fight. And the answer is, you're right. You can't win the fight. That's the, that's the whole point. But notice this. He says, when thou seest thine enemies, the, the horses, the chariots, the people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is, not will be, not will be there in a the moment. It says, the Lord thy God is with thee. See, you're not alone. You're not alone. There's days when you feel it. There's days when you feel alone. But God wants to make sure that you understand He secures that which is significant to Him. And you are significant to Him. You are secure. He's never going to leave. He's never going to forsake. 
And this whole passage is just full of promises, isn't it? Now, he says, I'm going to be with you when you go out against that battle. So I think the antithesis of that is also true. Because if you ever feel like God is not with you, then you're more than likely on the wrong battlefield. Did you get that? If you ever feel like God is over there and you're over here, you're fighting this thing alone, then you're probably on the wrong battlefield. Because God didn't need you to fight that fight. Notice this. He says, when thou goest out to battle against the thine enemies. So many times we waste our time fighting things that aren't our enemies. We waste so much energy fighting things that, or people that aren't our enemies. We fight things about politics. Yeah. We fight things about this. We fight things about that that waste so much time and so much energy. That's not a fight God gave us. Our enemies are threefold. Satan, the world, and the flesh. That's it. And we've got to be mindful that we don't waste time fighting things that God hasn't called us to fight. And you'll find Israel numerous times trying to have fights with something that God didn't tell them to go fight. And I'm guilty of doing the exact same thing. So get this. We are never, we are never at war with flesh and blood. Ever. So the moment you wake up and you think, man, I want to take it to this guy. Or I want to take it to this fight. Or I want to be a keyboard warrior about some certain cause. Understand this. You are never at war. Ever. You are never at war with flesh and blood. Never. We fight spiritual warfare, don't we? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of, the, of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Listen, we are flesh and bodies, are we not? We're, we're, we're spiritual people stuck in a flesh and body, but our tendency is to fight fleshly things, and we don't war after the flesh. Why? Verse 4. God doesn't give us flesh and weapons, did he? Right? You're like, yeah, he did. Thunder and light. No, he didn't. <laughs> you, ain't, you ain't got nothing. You ain't got nothing. No, God didn't equip you with, with physical weapons. What did he give you? Spiritual weapons. Verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to pull them down strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bring them into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. To the obedience of Christ. So, man, you got to get this. you got to get this. Here's your next point. You and God are always the majority. When it seems like you are outnumbered, when it seems like you are overwhelmed, when it seems like everything is crushing down around you, and that you are seeing horses and chariots, and it's more than you can handle, you and God are always the majority. Did you get that? You and God are always the majority. There's always more of them with you than the, that's with them. We just sing about it. He's the God of angel armies, isn't he? Second Kings chapter 6. Is that right, Chili? We can, we can turn that air down. So 2 Kings chapter 6, verse, verse 13 through 17, you have the king of Syria looking for Elisha because ever since, ever, it seems like Elisha has counsel of what the king of Syria is talking about. It, it is bad. And so everywhere the king of Syria moves to get Israel, Israel's skipping out of the way, and, and God's giving Elisha all this different counsel and doing all these different things. And so he's searching for Elisha in verse 13. And he said, this is the king of Syria, he says, go and spy where he is. He is, um, is Elisha. And I may send and fetch him, and it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Verse 14. Therefore, since he did their horses and chariots and a great host. Sound familiar? Since horses, chariots, and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. So verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, and host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. So, you have Elisha, he's the man of God, and he's got a servant, he's got a guy to be in this right right side and taking care of things, making sure that Elisha has what he needs to get the message out. This so is the, the servant gets up, he's handling his business, he looks out and goes, uh oh. This isn't good. We went to bed and there weren't any enemies. I wake up and now there's enemies. This isn't good. And so he hightails it back to Elisha, and he says in the uh, middle of middle of verse 15, and the servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? Elisha prayed. 
Sorry, in verse 16, and he answers, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that, that be with them. And the servant's like, what you talking about, Lois? Because what you're saying, I'm looking out there and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 10, 10, 25,000 or, or whatever the numbers, it doesn't even matter. This is a great host. And he goes, 1, 2. Uh, what you just said is a lie, right? Because uh, don't, 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 there's more with us than there's with them. And then, one, two, uh, uh, that, that's, not, that's, not, that's not true. Verse 17, now Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of what? Right? The chariots of fire, man. How cool is that? So he, he wakes up, he sees this huge army, he sees, he sees chariots, he sees horses, he sees all these all these great hosts, he's terrified. And Elisha prays, he says, Lord, just open his eyes. Help him to see things, not in a physical way, but in a spiritual way. And he opens his eyes and he sees horses and chariots of fire. Is that what we got? There is more with us than, than with them. I, I think we're good. And sometimes... Sometimes that's desperately what we need in a moment, in a fight, in a battle. When it seems like we're overwhelmed and we feel like we're the minority instead of the majority, we need somebody to pray to open our eyes. Amen? We need somebody to pray to open our eyes that we might see things in a spiritual way, not a physical way, not a fleshly way. Then we realize real quick, oh, we are the majority. We are the majority. And that's what he's trying to get them to understand in, in verse 1, but I want to make a practical application. Because notice what it says here at the end of verse 1. He says, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now, that's a beautiful picture of our salvation, right? Coming out of the world to the blood of the land, he brings them up, so he takes them back. So he takes them back 40 years. and says, hey, I brought you out of the land of Egypt, and I'm going to do some pretty powerful things over here in the promised land, but I just want to remind you of what I did then. Because what I did then doesn't even begin to compare to the small little stuff over here. So let me pract pract make a practical application here. No enemy you face in battle will compare with the spiritual warfare that was fought with your salvation. Do you understand the spiritual warfare that, take pl that took place when you met Christ? Do you understand the fight that was taking place when you met Christ? Would you call on the Lord Jesus Christ to save your soul? Do you understand the warfare that was taking place? And if you can trust God to secure your eternal salvation, what stops us from trusting God to deal with our situation, whatever we might face today? Nothing. So if I look at everything in perspective to what Jesus has done for me, that he's able to secure my eternity, that he's able to hold on to it, that he's able to, to provide me self salvation, he's able to secure it, and I'm going to be with him eternally, nothing that I face today can do that. Just change his perspective real quick. Well, this ain't nothing but a chicken wing compared to that. That's the greatest battle that was ever fought. Isn't it? And if he's able to redeem me from Egypt, he's able to redeem me from the world, then I'm already out of Egypt. I'm already free. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What should we say to say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Chapter 8, verse 36 and 37. As it's written for they say, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter and day. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. Not just a conqueror, but more than a conqueror through him that loved us. All right, that, that's, we got to get to verse 2 now. We've got to get to verse 2. And it shall be... When you are come nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people. All right, we've got we to gotta hang out here just for a moment. Because he says in verse 1, when thou goest out to battle. So the idea is you are, you're, you're, you're stepping out into battle. Verse 2 is now the battle is getting closer. When you draw nigh, when you are come nigh into the battle. So here's the next point you've got to get. You must take the fight to the enemy. You have to. So many times we have this reactionary relationship. We have this reactionary way of living. We're like surprised when difficulty comes. No, I should be expecting it. Isn't it? Peter even says that. Don't be surprised if some, some difficult things happen to you. Don't, why are you surprised by that? The enemy wants to destroy you. 
You should be, you should be ready to be shot at every corner, right? You should be ready to be taken out at, at, at any moment. Your head should be on a swivel. The Bible says to watch circumspectly. You need to take the fight to the enemy. They're always happening, right? You're always engaged in spiritual warfare. The moment you walk out the room, the moment you walk out of the house, the moment you walk out of this building, God with me? You have to take the fight. You have to take the fight for the enemy. Now, I really enjoy the game of football. I really, really do. I was not good at it, but I enjoyed it. And my favorite part about the game of football is getting hit and hit it. That was my favorite part. I loved it. The one thing I learned, and I ran to my old, uh, my old coach who taught me this, one thing I learned is as I was running the ball or whatever, if I was getting ready to get hit by a defender, if I could hit the defender before the defender hit me, it would jar them up. Just a split second. Right, there's this moment of impact that's expected. But if I can engage that defender before the defender hit me, I usually could run free, right? It, I, or the, the blow wasn't near as bad, or I wasn't tackled at that moment. So I, I learned, man, you got to take the fight to the defender, right? You have to take the fight to the enemy. And that, that's the same thing he says. It says, when ye are come nigh to the battle. Let's say, when the battle comes your way. It doesn't say when you walk out the door and the enemy is knocking at the door. It doesn't say that. It says when you are coming nigh to the battle, you address the battle. You know who the enemy is. You deal with the enemy. Every single moment of every single day, you take the fight. But notice this in verse 1. When thou goes out to battle against thine enemies and chariots and, and see his horses and chariots and, and people more than thou, be not afraid of them. All right, verse 2. And it shall be when, what's the next word? What's the word? Ye. Yeah. Ye, right? But when ye, plural, thee and thine and thou is always singular, ye is always plural. It's super important. We all have individual, individual fights. We all have individual battles. But when it's time to engage the enemy, we don't do it alone. We don't do it alone. Here's your next point. You must take the fight to the enemy with others who have the same enemy. They have the same enemy. And so many times we're going through difficult times and we're going through struggles and we don't tell anybody. I don't understand that because I'm guilty of doing the same. Oh, it's just me and the Lord. We'll get through this. I'm just pushing through. I'm just getting through it. Well, we need the body of Christ. We need each other. We need more because you aren't the only one facing the same battle. You're not the only one. Whatever I'm going through, I need to know that Kathy Hall is going through the exact same thing. Whatever I'm going through, I need to know that Deidre Wilson is going through the exact same thing. She has the same enemies. Now, might, the battle might look a little different, but it's the same three enemies. And what would happen if we would engage the enemy with others who have the same enemy? You wouldn't feel so isolated. You weren't the only one facing it. First Kings 19, verse 14, you have Elijah who just took on the prophets of Baal, and now he's on the run. And the, the, it says, he said, verse 14, I have been very jealous for the Lord of God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken my covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now he's convinced he's the only one left. He is convinced there's nobody else holding the standard, that he's convinced that nobody else is serving the Lord, nobody else is standing up for righteousness, and God sort of steps in a few verses later in verse 18 and says, yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel. We get so focused on our own little fight, so focused in our own little world, that he missed 7,000 people doing this. But be careful to think it's just us and nobody else. There are others having the same fight, doing the same thing. Had another pastor show up in here the other day. I was up here measuring doing some different things. Another pastor came walking to the door, was able to shake his hand, had a great conversation. Phenomenal. I was like encouraged. 
Not only do I have a conversation with the pastor at that time, it's always encouraging. But this one was really, really encouraging. I really enjoyed it. Super encouraging. Why? Because I recognize, wow, he's going the same direction now. He's doing the same thing now. And he's going to lead his church the same way, do the same things we are. And I was encouraging. Why? Because we fight the same thing. And how can we do that side by side? I was just, I don't know, fired me up. The Lord says, hey, uh, you're, you're not the one there, Elijah. There's 7,000 uh, 7, more. Don't think you're the only one. What happens when we fight side by side with the body of Christ? What happens? When we lay on, what happens when we serve together? What happens when we minister together? We get encouraged by one another. No. Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. Paul's writing to the church of Philippi. He says, yet I suppose it's necessary to send to you a paraphrodite, my brother, and look at this, companion in labor and fellow soldier. That word's only used twice in scripture. Fellow soldier. But your messenger, he that ministered to my wants. Paul's recognizing something. But you need a soldier to get through where you're going through. And I'm going to send you somebody to help you fight. Somebody who's been through some things. Somebody's going to come along and, and encourage you in the Lord. So verse 2, Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 2, it says, And it shall be, when you are come nigh into the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people. Now the priest would have been proclaiming the word of God, and they didn't always have access to the word of God. So the priest is getting to proclaim the truth of God's word. Now, here's what's also interesting to me, and this is it's in your notes, but this is super important to get as well. Often, when we go through difficult times and struggles, we feel like something is ready to just destroy us, it drives us away from the Word instead of to it. Doesn't it? The Bible says, though, the priest is the speak. We need to hear from our high priest. His name is Jesus Christ. We need to hear from the Word of God. We need to hear from what God has to say. And so many times, difficult times drive, drive us away from the Bible instead of, instead of to it. <clears throat> verse 3. And here's what this priest is supposed to say. And she'll say to them, Hear, O Israel, you approach this day and to battle against thine enemies. Let not your heart, hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble. Neither be you terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he that goeth you, with you to fight for you against your enemies, to save you. Now, notice this. Verse 1. When thou goest out the battle, verse 2. When you are come nigh unto the battle, verse 3. You approach this day unto battle. In other words, you're going forth into battle. And there's a moment where you get a little bit closer. And then there's a moment where you're in it. You follow this? Well, Tony, I'm not, I'm not going through a hard time. Then you need to be making your way toward the battle. And as you get a little bit closer, there's going to be, you're going to be, you can't do that alone. You need others to be with you. But then verse 3 says, there's, there's the day of battle. This day, we approach to this time to engage in warfare. Well, verse 3, he says, Hero is when you approach this day of the battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint. Fear not. Don't tremble. You'll be terrified because of them. In other words, here's your point. You will always come to a moment of crisis. And I've, I got news for you. Believe me. doesn't matter if you've been saved for two months or if you've been saved for 27 years. God will always bring you to a spot, to a place, to a moment of crisis. Well, how do I know when I reach the moment of crisis? Here's how you'll know. You'll be tempted to be full of fear and to faint. You'll be tempted to walk away. You'll be tempted not to take another step. You'll be tempted not to engage in it. That's how you'll know when you need a moment of crisis. And you just can't go forward anymore. You rephrase that. Or you won't go forward anymore. I'm too scared to move forward. Okay. But notice this. He said, you know, sometimes it's wise 
when you read your Bible to realize what's not written. Pay attention to what's written. But also pay attention to what's not there. He says, you approach this day into battle against your enemies. <clears throat> Make sure your, your swords are sharp. You say that? You, you approach this day against your enemies. <clears throat> Make sure you stay in formation. It doesn't say that. <clears throat> it talks about their hearts. <clears throat> Let not your hearts faint. Fear not. And do not tremble, and neither be terrified because of the moments of great adversity. Moments of great adversity are going to force you to deal with the issues that are inside your heart. Can't stress that enough. The reason God allows difficult times in your life, the reason you go through hard times. It's because God's revealing what's going on inside of you. And it's your heart. Sometimes the reason God watches the battle is just so you can defeat the enemy. It's so that you can see what's going on inside of you. And he addresses what's going on inside of you. You find out what's going on inside of you and you get squeezed. So here's the question you have to ask. When I engage the enemy that day, in that moment, what am I going to do in that moment? <clears throat> What's my response going to be? Here's the question. He says this. Let not your hearts faint. Here's your question. Will I faint? And that word faint literally means to melt like wax, melt like butter, melt like chocolate. And C.T. Studd, what a great name for a preacher. Right? C.T. Studd wrote a book, and if you can get a hold of it, write, it, write this down. It's called Chocolate Soldiers. It's about that thin. Um, I read it twice on an airplane in an hour-long flight. It's not a long book, but it's called Chocolate Soldiers. You can get it free online, PDF version, whatever. Man in a rocket. Chocolate Soldiers. Who melt in the face of adversity, they faint. So the question is, will you faint? Are you a chocolate soldier? The next thing is, he says, he says, faint. He says, let not your hearts faint. Then he says, fear not. Will I fear? Will I fear? And that word fear is implying surrender. It's submit. It's just saying, I'm going to capitulate here. I'm standing in awe that this is too big for me. I can't handle it. <clears throat> I, I, I just can't. I surrender. In other words, I choose not to fight. And that's when the enemy says, fine. I'll conquer you without a shot fired. And unfortunately, that's where the majority of the body of Christ is today. They're in a spot of fear. They're not fearing the Lord. They fear the enemy. And so they fear the enemy and they refuse to engage. And then they live in harmonious peace with the enemy. And it doesn't work that way. So will, will I faint? Will I, will, I, will I fear? Middle of last part of verse 3, and do not tremble. Here's the next thing. Will I freeze? So terrified that I that I can't do anything. You know, they, they talk about the flight, the fight, the freeze thing, right? I, I think it's biblical here. It's faint, it's fear, it's it, it's it's flee, it's it's freeze. Will I will I faint? Will I fear? Here's the next one. Sorry. Will will I flee? I'm trembling. I just run away. Will I, will I freeze or I'm terrified or I just can't move forward? Will I, will, I, will I fight? Will I fight? Because he says in verse 3, he approached this day to battle against your enemies. The whole purpose of him showing up to the battle is to fight one. Did you know that? It's to fight one. 
You ever been part of a sports team where they were defeated before they even got off the bus? You're like, I'm, we're not going to even win this thing. We're going to go there. We're going to put in the time. We're going to play the basketball game. We're going to run this track move. We're going to do this cross country thing. Or play this football game or tennis or you name it. But this, this person is going to defeat us. And so and we'll go through the motions. There's no fight in you. And it's hard to be a part of a team like that. Where they're defeated before they even show up. And so many believers were the same way. The whole idea in verse 3 is that you approach this day unto battle against thine enemies. The, the idea is that there's a fight. The idea is that you're going to show up to a fight. Now, that takes us to verse 4 as we land this thing. Verse 4. <clears throat> he says, For the Lord your God, the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Here's what I love about these fights that we have against the enemy. Here's what I love is that we have a not-so-secret weapon. Did you get that? We don't have a secret weapon. We have a not-so-secret weapon. His name is the Lord God Almighty. His, his name is, is Jesus Christ. His name is Captain of the Lord's hosts. His name is the Lord of hosts. It's Jehovah. Evil him. His name is God. And so you can faint. You can. You, you can fear. You can flee. You can freeze. Or you can fight. And who you fight with? You fight with your father alongside you. You have a narcissistic weapon. And he says this, for the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies. So quickly, the battle isn't yours to fight. The battle belongs to the Lord. There's a little song we used to sing back in the 90s, right? The battle belongs to the Lord. I think we need to pull that one out in this few weeks. <clears throat> Second Chronicles chapter 20. <clears throat> Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 14. It says, Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mattaniah, the Levite, the sons of Asen, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. They said, Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and, and thou, King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord, I mean, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but whose? What does it say? God. It's God's. The battle is not yours, but it, it's God's. Tomorrow, go ye down against them. I love that. I, love, I thought you said it was yours. <laughs> I, I thought you said it was God's. Yeah, go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jerusalem. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves and stand ye still. Does that confuse anybody else? Hey, go ye out against them. And then when you get there, just go, you're not even going to have a fight. You're just going to have to stand there. Just stand still. And what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to see the salvation of the Lord, Lord with you. See that? Oh, Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Oh, man, there's great victory there, isn't there? Because here's the next point. I don't have to fight, but I have to show up. I don't have to fight, but I do have to show up. Well, then why are you showing up in the first place if God's just going to fight my battles? No, 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 that's not how it works. The battle belongs to the Lord. You're not going to have to fight, but you need to stand there and watch him go to battle for you. There's so many times we're so busy fighting the wrong enemy 
And God's over here fighting spiritual warfare and we're clueless and we miss it. And somehow along the way we begin to question God. God, where were you? Where are you? Why aren't you here for me? Why aren't you fighting my battle? Because I'm over here on the right battlefield. I'm fighting your enemies over here and you didn't show up. Well, no wonder you can't see victory. No wonder you're not getting any victory. Because you're not showing up. The idea is that every day you get up and die to yourself and you approach toward the enemy, you go to battle. It's every day, it's when, not if. And you're going to draw nigh, and it's going to be more than you can handle. And you realize, wait, me and God are the majority, we got this. And then you show up to the battlefield and you stand there and you watch God fight. And you watch God move. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil of having done all to what? Stand. God's not asking you to fight. God's asking you to stand. And he gives you the armor of God. Which, by the way, if you ever read Ephesians chapter 6, you find out it's spiritual armor. It's not physical armor. And the one weapon he gives you is the sword of the Spirit. It's the word of God. It's the only weapon. You don't even need to wield that one. You just get to speak that one. You get a shield of faith that quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Ephesians chapter, or sorry, Exodus chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. As they were coming out of Egypt and they're stuck and they're getting ready to hit the, hit the Red Sea, they've got no place to go. Pharaoh's army's question down on them. Verse 13, and Moses says to the people, Fear not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Easy for you to say, man. You got Pharaoh's army and his chariots coming after me, and there's an ocean, there's a water here, and I can't, I can't swim across this thing, and they're coming after Stand still? Okay. I guess I'll stand still. Because uh, if I fight them, I'm dead. If I go in the water, I'm dead. Might as well stand here and be dead. I don't know what else you want me to do. I'm going to stand here and see the salvation of the Lord. And what happens? God separates the sea. They walk over on dry land. And as soon as they cross over, it crosses them and kills the enemy and defeats them. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord. Why? In verse 14, the Lord shall fight for you. And I love this, and you shall hold your, your peace. What does that mean? We cry all the time. If you're going to cry, cry up. Cry to the Lord. He will come to rescue. Now let's make one final application here. You already have the victory. But you will never see it if you refuse to show up for the fight. You already have victory. But you will never see it if you refuse to show up for the fight. When you woke up this morning, there was a fight. And you're tempted to put all your stuff away right now. Come on. Come on. When you woke up this morning, your flesh had lusts. And Satan did everything in his power to make sure you didn't get here at least with the right of heart attitude. And the world is against you. When you woke up this morning, did you got yourself and you step on the battlefield and said, okay, Lord, here's my enemies. And here's how they're attacking. Instead of shying away from the battle, you stepped up and said, okay, Lord, go to fight. Go to war. Go to battle. I want to stand here and watch you go to town. Are we living a defeatist attitude? Are we living a defeated life? Not realizing that God has already given you victory. You just got to show up and see it. That's what we got. So many times we live a defeated, defeated life. We call ourselves the saints and we say we're in the Lord's army. Time for the saints to do some marching. And we'll go march into that. Amen? Let's stay here. Maybe you're struggling with something. Maybe you feel like you're being defeated. Maybe you feel like you're, you're tempted to fight. Or you're tempted to flee. Or you're tempted to freeze. Whatever it might be. 
If you've been fighting this thing on your own, remember, you're not alone. The Lord will fight. But you need to show up with some brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe you need to pull somebody in and say, hey, this is the flavor of my battle. And I've been trying it on my own, and I'm miserable. Will you come and stand with me? Will you come approach the battle with me? Because I need a fellow soldier. All right, we're not going to have anybody up front, none of that. Maybe you just need to grab somebody and say, hey, here's where I'm struggling. And I need somebody to pray me. I need somebody to speak some truth to me. I need it. Because how, how dare you walk out of here without stepping forth on the battle and watching God work? Right? I love you guys. It's not walking defeated. Attitudes. Let's walk in. Let's, get, let's, let's do some marching. And then tonight, 4 o'clock, let's play some volleyball. Right? Let's get after it. Let's enjoy each other's time. Let's, let's have fun. Let's, let's let God do some business in our hearts.